and we are buying it primarily in Central for Russian, East European, and Eurasian studies. And today it's a unique pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Professor Jeremy Friedman from the Harvard, Harvard Business School. It's a little bit unusual for us to have a professor from uh, the business school, but Jeremy is there as a professor of international economics, business administration, and history. Uh, at Harvard, we don't have it here uh, at Stanford. Jeremy completed his dissertation at Princeton in 2011, and then uh, was he called uh, director, associate director of the Grand Strategy Project at Yale. Before moving to Harvard, he's the author of two magnificent books: the first one on the Sino-Soviet competition, and the third about the fate of socialism in the Third World during the Cold War. And today he will speak about indeed the ideas and practices of socialism trying to find its way and place between the first world, <coughs> second world, and third world. Concept that we don't use anymore, but it would be a nice refreshing. Jeremy has so many achievements, but all of them are both and overshadowed by the fact that he is a graduate of Stanford. <laughs> he was here, he got his BA, and all I can say without exaggeration, he's the best ever. I'm the great student that I've had in my life. Thank you, thank you, Sam, for having me. Thank you, Lamir, for everything done in the past 20 years um, and the very kind words. Um, so, I'm the talk I'm going to give is largely based on the book that I published last year um, called Right for Revolution from the Social Scene in the Third World. Um, but to put that in a larger context uh, for my historiographical project that I'm trying to do, including the first book, including the beginnings of what I was called my third book project. Um, and the idea is basically this, and this is the, the second book I published. Um, I'm really just trying to create a kind of history of socialism. So um, those of us in the history field know the history of capitalism is very fashionable and very popular these days. Um, there are jobs in the history of capitalism, there are conferences in the history of capitalism, there are workshops and journal articles and journal editions in the history of capitalism. Right? Um, and essentially, the core tenet of the history of capitalism is that capitalism in practice is different than capitalism in theory. Right? In theory, capitalism is about perfect information and efficient markets and price mechanisms and such. And what the history of capitalism is about is all the ways in which the reality of capitalism right, differs from the theory of capitalism. Right? In theory, capitalism is about you know, freely entered contract between you know, labor and capital. In reality, there's coercion, there's oppression, there's racism, there's violence, right? there's lack of perfect information, there's manipulation, there's corruption. Right? And that's sort of what history of capital is really about, is all the ways in which the reality differs from theory. Um, and there is no equivalent history of socialism as such, right? We don't have conference history of socialism, we don't have positions in the history of socialism, we don't have you know, journal editions in the history of socialism. Um, and I think the reason we don't have this is because there isn't really that kind of room currently in the discourse for how socialism in practice differs from socialism in theory. Um, and the problem is that you have people who basically want to claim, right, that that's because socialism has never actually been tried, right? Socialism in practice, because it differs from socialist theory, therefore it's not really true socialism. Um, and that's a perfectly legitimate political claim, perfectly legitimate ideological claim, but it is not a historical claim. Right? As historians, there is a reality of how socialism has manifested itself throughout history, and I think we actually need a history of socialism as such that traces the history of socialism, you know, across time and place. Uh, and that's really what my historiographical project is about through the first book, the second book, hopefully third and fourth. Um, and so this book, right, is that how socialism evolves, right, through the encounter between theory and practice. Right? That's the whole point here, that it actually, socialism iterates, right? You have a theory, you try the theory in practice, the theory runs into difficulties in reality, so you, you alter the theory, right? You try and different model. Um, and there's a process of iteration between, you know, theory and practice. Um, and it evolves over time, the same way that capitalism evolves over time. The same way we move from sort of laissez-faire capitalism to Keynesian capitalism, neoliberal capitalism to you know wherever we are now right i mean capitalism also sort of evolves and iterates over time uh, and my argument is that socialism does the same thing um, and the third world in the cold war period is kind of the library this is where the experiments are happening uh, so this is as i said this is the second of two books as part of this project the first book uh, came out in 2015 um, and the reason i concentrate on the third world as this the the, the laboratory of socialism the locus of these experiments is because in the 1960s, socialism is kind of this inflection point. Uh, in the first world, the workers are no longer revolutionary, right? So the idea, of course, in Marx was that socialism happens, revolution happens in the most advanced capitalist countries, right? That's where capitalism has 
you know, has developed the, the forces of production to their maximum to the point that then right, the workers can take over the means of production and they can use them to distribute them to the world world. So revolution was supposed to happen in London or Paris or New York or Chicago or something. Um, and it looked like that might happen in the early 20th century. Um, it looked like it was feasible in the you know, 20s, especially in the 1930s and Great Depression. Um, and then after the Second World War, against the expectations of both the Soviets and, by the way, a lot of people in the West, the West does not go back to the Depression after the, after the Second World War. Um, instead, you get the birth of sort of welfare state capitalism. And that means that by the 1960s, through collective bargaining, through increased social spending, right, you have a working class that has a state in the existing economic order, right, that is no longer revolutionary. They might want, they might want to strike for higher pay or shorter hours or whatever, but they're not in a position where they want to actually try to go the means of production. Right? They want higher salary, they don't want to seize the factory anymore. Um, that is not what the AFL-CIO, for example, is trying to do in the 1960s. Um, and so the idea that that is how revolution is going to happen is going to be the workers in the West, the most advanced capitalist countries seizing power, right? that's not realistic. So that's kind of a beating to look like a dead end by the 1960s. In the second world, right, the quote-unquote second world, the communist world, in the Soviet Union, Eastern Europe, um, there are attempts at reform. Right? They do try to change the model over time to sort of you know, match reality. Um, you think about the Gestapo reforms in 1964. There are other reforms that happened in Eastern Europe, um, but these reforms fail because they run into entrenched bureaucracies. Right? There's too many people have too much at stake to allow the system to change that much, um, and so you know Brezhnev responds with stability of cadres and such. So basically, the Second World, you know, growth slows down, but reforms can't really happen because of bureaucratic resistance. And so if you're going to experiment with socialism in the 1960s, it's going to happen in the Third World. Because this is where you actually have a market, right? This is where you have countries that are brand new that need to develop their economies and to build political systems, and they're sort of in the market for a system of political economy that suits them. Um, so that's where the experimentation really happens, and that's why that's what I concentrate on in this book. Um, so this is right, decolonization really begins in earnest after World War II. It starts for the most part in Asia in the late 40s. By the middle of the 1960s, most of Africa is decolonized. This happens very, very rapidly. And this radically changes where sort of the market for the buyers of the socialist model of the economy really are. Um, so these are, in my book, the countries that deal with the ones that are here. I have five chapters of five different countries. Um, Indonesia, Iran, Tanzania, Angola, and Chile, uh, which, um, not coincidentally, are two in Asia, two in Africa, one in Latin America. So they sort of cover the space geographically. They also cover it chronologically from you know, the 1940s in Indonesia all the way to the 1980s in Iran. The idea is that these are not really cases, in the sense that cases are sort of distinct and parallel like the way they are with both, but they're actually episodes, right? That they're sequential. They build on one another, and there's a, you know, there's, there's a sequential relationship between the kinds of experiments that go on, which I'll detail in this presentation. Um, so the problem is that for, in order to develop a model of socialism for the third world, you have to answer certain kinds of questions that are unique to the third world environment, right? That are not really foreseen in either Marxism or Marxist Leninism, because this was not where socialism was, a social revolution was supposed to take place. So if you're trying to build a socialist model for a post-colonial state, you run into some of these sorts of problems. Right? First of all, is democracy or authoritarianism better for building socialism? Um, so if you have a situation, let's say, where you have a revolutionary party take over, you had a civil war, you already have a revolutionary party that has a monopoly of power. Uh, so they don't have to worry about dealing with an opposition. Right? They don't have to worry about, you know, um, negotiation in parliament and such, um, or electoral campaigns. Um, and so it's not really as much of an issue. Um, if, you know, if let's say it happened in the developing, in the, in the developed world in which, you know, perhaps somebody won an election, you have a history of entrenched democracy, right? It's not really a debate as to what form of government is best. But you have a post-colonial state which is setting up a new system of politics, right? This is now a relevant question, right? What's going to be the best way forward for some A democratic competitive system, right, or an authoritarian government? How do you build socialism in an agrarian economy? Right? The whole premise of social revolution under Marx is that capitalism develops the forces of production, right, brings them to their apex, and the state takes them over. But what if there are no, essentially, forces of production, right? I mean, there are, right, so since agriculture, but you don't really have factories, you don't have industries, you don't have infrastructure, you don't have railroads, you don't have roads, you don't have ports, right? The things that capitalism was supposed to build don't exist yet. So can you build socialism in an economy in which the material prerequisites don't exist yet, and they have to be built under socialism instead of taken over by socialism. Um, and if that's going to happen, then what is the role of the state versus the private sector? Right? If the private sector already did its job, the state takes it over, right? That's the model that's supposed to work for. If you have to develop them from the beginning, can that be done by the state? 
And if so, how? And if you do it through private capital, then aren't you just building capitalism? Um, how do racial, ethnic, national divisions play in socialist politics? This is a big question about the world, right? Because in most of the post colonial world, people don't see their oppression and liberation in terms of class, right? They see it in terms of race, right? Who oppresses you if you're you know, in Africa in the 1950s? It's white people, white Europeans. It might be you know, Christians in the Middle East. It's not the bourgeoisie, right? You're, you're interpreting your oppression in terms of you know, identities that are considered um, you know, ephemeral according to Marx, right? That are not considered the essential differences, which are those of class. And so how do you sell a class-based ideology to people who see their narratives of oppression and liberation in terms of other identities? Um, and then especially should religious interests be combated, right, or accommodated? You know, Marx says religious people are the masses. The Soviets have, you know, a pro-atheism campaign. Um, and so inside, you know, existing communist countries, religion is treated as an enemy, it's treated as, you know, something that, that obscures, right, um, deflects the masses from revolutionary activities. Um, but you're dealing with countries in which, first of all, you have religion, which belief is far more widespread. Not just that, but religious authorities and institutions hold political power, hold economic power. Think about the Middle East, and you have, you know, not only do you know Islamic elites wield political power, but also own much of the land. Um, they're you know economic powers as well. And if you try to combat them, right? Part of the problem is the colonial narrative is often seen as one of religion. It's one of Christians oppressing Muslims. So if you then go ahead and attack Islam as well. As being reactionary in some way, right? You're putting yourself in the, in the position of the colonial oppressor. So these are all questions that you deal with if you're developing a model of socialism for the third world, right? That you didn't really have to deal with if you were building it for the first world or for the second world. Um, so I think ideology plays an important role in this, um, but it's important how you understand ideology. So this is this is my understanding of ideology. This is how I define it in the book, and this, um, you know how I think it makes the most sense. Is that you know instead of a prescription of Ideology says we do X, Y, and Z. Ideology is a systematically simplified way of understanding reality that facilitates judgment and action. The idea being that reality is always infinitely complicated, right? If you try to assimilate every detail of reality, it's paralyzing. So what ideology does is it simplifies reality for you. It tells you from all these details, which are the sally points, right? What caused what? Who are the good guys and who are the bad guys, right? How do you make sense of this? And then once you have a narrative, right, it picks out the important details for you, then you can decide, okay, well, now what do I do? Um, and it doesn't necessarily tell you what to do, but it's simplified the story such that now at least you have a way of figuring it out. So how it translates into policy, just the question, right? Ideology does not predetermine the policy outcome. It's not that if you're a communist, you will do this, right? Different communists can do different things. That's the point. Um, but that depends on their beliefs, capabilities, and interests, right? You have a certain ideology, but what is your belief about the world? Right? And what are your capabilities? What can you actually do about it? What are your interests? So that may mean that the same communist countries will make different policy choices based on different beliefs, capabilities, and interests. So this is one thing I talked about in the first book, is how does this translate in terms of how the Soviets and the Chinese um, adapt their ideology to the third world context. Um, so there's, I guess, different, different models here in terms of you know, what they're actually pushing. So again, this comes from the same ideology. Marxism and Leninism says that you know, imperialism is the highest age of capitalism. To be anti imperialist, to be anti capitalist, and vice versa. Both the Soviet Union and the People's Republic of China believe right, that they are trying to overthrow a capitalist imperialist system. But the reality is right, that the Soviets are focused on the anti capitalist part, in part because they're coming from what was an imperialist power, and the Russian Revolution has been focused on equality, um, going back to the Decembrists. Um, and the Chinese are focused on anti imperialism because the impetus for revolutionary change inside China was the failure of the Chinese state to stand up to the Europeans going back to the days of the opium. Right? That's what justifies revolution in China, is the fact that the Chinese state has failed to defend its people from the outside. So it's more of an anti-imperialist impetus. Um, and so they translate this into different models of, again, how you answer those questions. What should you do if you're developing? The Soviets are focused on, first of all, peaceful coexistence. You don't want a war with the West. Um, what you want to try to do is build a socialist economy. So you need to build heavy industry first. Because if you don't have industry, you need to build a working class. The working class will create a communist party, right? You don't want to have private capitalism. So where do you get capital from? Well, for now, at least the early 1960s, the Soviets are going to give it to you in the form of aid. So the Soviets give you know, aid to the state, the state industrializes, you build a working class, the working class creates a communist party, budget over the country, right? That's what this is supposed to work. 
Um, and you don't need to sort of confront the imperialists because all you need to do is build a socialist economy domestically. The Chinese say these countries are not ready for socialism, right? They're not prepared for that kind of economic system. What you have to do first is focus on detaching the colony from their former imperial master and on overthrowing the domination of the international system by the former colonial powers. So if that means you have to actually fight to kick the colonials out, as in Algeria or in the Congo or in Angola, the Chinese will say, you know, yes, here are the weapons, we'll help you do it. Um, we'll train your fighters. So they support armed struggle. Um, don't worry about heavy industry, right? Don't worry about things like metallurgy first. First focus on light industry and agriculture. So food processing, textiles, right? The kind of things that people need in their daily lives that will improve their living standards. Because the idea is that you don't need to worry about building the working class. First build a country, first build a nation that can stand on its own. And what will make people believe, right, in the superiority of their post-colonial nation state is that their living standards rise after independence. So that means that they have better clothes and they have better food. Um, and if it takes private capital to do this and private markets, so be it. Right. The Chinese are okay with small scale market economies that focus on things like consumer goods and textiles, because that's a way of, you know, of building legitimacy for post-colonial states. The important thing, right, is kick out the foreigners, kick out all the French landowners from Algeria, kick out, you know, the, the, the Dutch factory owners in Indonesia, right? Those are the people, because as long as that economic influence remains, right, that keeps the colonial power having influence over the country. And so this is an example of how you translate, right, how different communist countries translate their ideologies into practice for what a socialist model of the third world actually looks like. Um, and this wasn't just talk. They spent a lot of resources trying to do this. And these are not rich countries to begin with, right? So the Union has you know, an economy less than half the size of the United States, and China's a fraction of that. So these are expensive policies um, for both these countries. This is the largest Soviet aid program in the developed world. This is the Aswan High Dam in Egypt. Um, this is still the monument to Soviet Arab friendship that stands in Aswan today. Um, this is China's biggest aid project in the developing world. This is the Pizarro Railway, which uh, China built in the early 1970s, the height of the Cultural Revolution um, that connected the copper belt in Zambia to the port of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. It was a way of you know, exporting the copper belt going around from Asia after their independence. Um, so again, these are extremely expensive programs uh, for, for countries that really can't afford it that much. But the point is that this conversation about how you build a model of socialism that fits the post colonial world is not just a top down conversation. It's not just Moscow and Beijing sort of deciding you know, what models are going to try to you know, pawn off on various countries of Asia, Africa, and Latin America, but it's also a horizontal lateral conversation. So, this is an article in the Nationalist, the main Tanzania newspaper from 1972. This is Salvador Allende, the Marxist president of Chile, um, and it's about our Ujamaa in Chile. So, Ujamaa is a Swahili word. It was used in Tanzania as the word for their version of socialism, means something like familyhood or togetherness. It is obviously not a word that Salvador Allende ever used. He did not speak Swahili. Um, but Tanzanians himself, as in conversation, attempted their building socialism in Ujamaa in Tanzania with the socialist project in Chile. Um, this is one of many, many examples I could pick. Um, but the point is, this conversation is horizontal as well. It's not just you know Tanzania Moscow or Tanzania Beijing, but it's also Tanzania Chile and Chile Angola. And Angola, Indonesia, right? As we'll see. Um, so I talked about evolution. So let's see how this evolution actually works out in practice. I want to trace things, but I've heard from a little bit of how this works out over space, but I want to show how it changes over time. Right? What are the vectors by which the socialist model evolves? Because the important thing here is to tell us where the start where it started at the end of the Cold War, and then where it started at the beginning of the Cold War, and where it is by the end of the Cold War. So you know, what kind of socialism are we left with? What has this produced by the time of the Cold War? So in terms of the evolution of economic models, as I said, the Soviets begin by supporting state-led industry. Um, and they go out of their way to promote heavy industry, even countries that are a bit reluctant. So this is, you know, Soviet embassy in Jakarta is one, one message I, I picked, um, in which what's important here is that the Soviets are actually proactively proposing to go to the Indonesian government and offer to fund, right, a state-led tin industry. Right, Indonesia has not yet come to them with this. This is the Soviets proactively saying we should pitch them on a state-led tin industry because this is how we get them to build right, the state sector of its national economy. Um, and so why do they do this? Again, this, these are expensive policies. The Soviets are not holding equity 
in the factories they're building in the developing world. They are not getting a piece of the profits. Um, this is this is built on credit, which most of the time they don't get paid back. Um, and if they do get paid back, it probably doesn't cover their costs. Um, so they are not profiting from any of this. Um, so well, why do they do this? So this is Yuri Koshkara writing in the New Times, right? He's saying that if you change right, the material structure, the economic structure of society, you will then change the social structure of society. Right? So once you start building heavy industry, it is impossible to avoid a certain amount of differentiation. Right? The bourgeoisie is weak, but it is growing. But if you build heavy industry, the result of industrialization will lead to the growth of the working class. In these circumstances, new social trends and organizations may quite possibly arise. Right? What he means by new organizations is a communist party. You build the industry that creates the working class, the working class creates the communist party. You can affect the politics by changing the economic structure. That's the philosophy he's right on. That's why it's so important to build heavy industry, because that's how you get the social material for a communist political organization. Um, and that fails in, in, they try, especially in West Africa. It fails because we just need to realize exactly what Yuri Koshkar said. Right? The same of President Guinea realizes, hey, guess what? These aid programs the Soviets are trying to build in my country, the goal is to overthrow me one day. And the goal is to build the communist party to replace me, and so he kicks out the Soviet ambassador. And the next year, when he moved to Mali, figured out the same thing. And he goes to the Soviet ambassador and says, You guys better stop trying to overthrow me. Um, and so this turns into a fiasco. It's expensive, and leaders don't want it. So they said, Okay, well, this model of Soviet funded heavy industry around the developing world, right, is really not going to work. So what's plan B? Right? Plan A is not what's plan B. So this guy named Julius Nereri is president of Tanzania. Uh, and he is not, does not identify as a Marxist Leninist, he's not a Soviet style communist. He went to school with Edinburgh. Uh, he's more of a Fabian socialist. Um, the Soviets and the Chinese didn't like him initially because he didn't seem to like the idea of you know, class struggle. He seemed to want to accommodate you know, white Indian interests in you know, post independence Tanzania, so he wasn't seen as you know, being like African nationalist enough. Um, but once your plan fails, he's got a different plan. His plan is instead of relying on you know, state sponsored aid to build heavy industry, what if we rely on what we have? Self reliance. We have agriculture. Uh, well, if we don't want foreign aid, what we're going to do is we have to sort of, you know, bootstrap our way through agriculture. We communalize agriculture, we increase harvests, we sell harvests overseas, we earn foreign currency, we use that foreign currency to invest in our own infrastructure, our own industry, right? Bootstrapping your way forward through self-reliance. Um, this is a new plan. Soviets are actually open to this. They say, well, you know, he, again, he's not a Marxist, he's not Soviet aligned. In fact, he seems more friendly towards China. He visits Beijing twice before he ever goes to Moscow. Um, and so, you know, the Soviets, if this goal by international influence, they probably shouldn't support their area. They probably should sort of, you know, try to squash it, but they don't, right? They want to see if this works. Um, he, he posted a Rush Declaration in 1967. Um, this is sort of his big declaration about Tanzania's move to socialism, in which he says that the important thing is that the major means of production are controlled by the peasants, the machine of the government, and the government should be run by a ruling party composed of peasants and workers. So that sounds good enough for Moscow. But here's the really interesting part. So again, my argument is that a lot of people when looking at this in the past have said, well, the Soviets didn't really believe in this stuff. This is just about, you know, finding third world leaders who say they're socialists, that, you know, they're anti-American. This is about sort of gaining allies in the Cold War. There's an actual difference of opinion. There's a, there's a live discussion that's happening about how you evaluate, for example, whether or not Jewish Nereri is growing because he's a socialist. So this is the kind of stuff I really nerd out about, um, finding these kinds of documents. Right, one Soviet economic, economic expert in Tanzania saying, actually, I don't think they're really building socialism, and one guy back in the foreign ministry in Moscow, the African Union, saying, actually, I think they are. Right, they're trying to figure out whether or not this is socialism. And by the way, I mean, there's not enough space for this in this presentation, but the Americans and the British and the Canadians and everyone else are all starting to figure out, like, which side of the Cold War divide are really on? Is it really building socialism? Um, the point is, this is an open question, right? It's not simply that you know you choose your side in the Cold War, and that's kind of what you are. Whoops. Sorry about that. Um, now, Nureri is the Chinese are very heavily involved once again. This is um, you know, one of China's um, most important allies in the developing world. Um, and again, Tanzania themselves are having this conversation. Right? They understand that the Tanzanian model of socialism is an important experiment for socialism globally. So this is another piece from a Tanzanian newspaper. Right? Are we deviating or setting a precedent? Um, now, it might seem like in retrospect, I mean, if you look at the Cold War, it seems sort of, sort of only the Soviet Union decides what socialism is, maybe China, right? But 
The idea of Tanzania deciding where and by setting the precedent for the rest of the world seems kind of absurd, unless you actually take into account that no, this is a real sort of global conversation among socialists in which, yes, certain countries are more powerful than others, but that does not mean, right, in the realm of ideology, they have, you know, they're the only ones that matter, they have all the power. So there's an internal conversation in Tanzania about, you know, are we deviating or setting a precedent? Um, it turns out, by the way, that it doesn't really work because if you have too little agriculture, but you don't have the resources to have, let's say, tractors, you're not going to be able to actually increase your production very much. And so without significant foreign aid, right, Tanzania was not very successful in increasing production. And so what you ended up with was a country that sooner or later, right, especially after the, the, the oil market with the rise in oil prices, um, was forced to rely on foreign aid after all. Uh, and so this sort of plan B doesn't work either. Right. So what's plan C for the economic model? Alexei Kiva, so a um, expert, criticized the Tanzanians after the fact for saying that, well, the problem was that they forced villagization, but it was premature. They shouldn't have done that. Um, which is really ironic coming from a country that forced villagization on the largest scale in the history of the world, right, 40 years before this. Um, so what's plan C? So, you know, Tanzania, the, the model of Ujamaa in Tanzania becomes a failure. It's pretty clear by about 1974, 1975. Um, and this is precisely when the Portuguese regime is overthrown. Um, and you have new Marxist Leninist parties that are now taking over the independent countries of Angola and Mozambique. Uh, and the Soviets get heavily involved in both of these. So now Angola says, we're not trying to build African socialism like you already did. Right? We believe there's one socialism, it's the same socialism for all. That's what we want to build. We want to be real Marxist Leninists. Um, this is a you know, poster that um, the Cubans come to help the MPLA. Some 30,000 Cuban soldiers are serving in Angola, which is an amazing thing. First of all, given the size of the population of Cuba, the second of all, given how far Cuba is from Angola. Um, it's basically a Soviet airlift that moves 30,000 soldiers, Cuban soldiers, to Angola, right? Um, where they're fighting largely South African troops, by the way. Um, so that's why there's, there's Fidel Castro and Chicago City Nature, the first president of Angola, on the, on the billboard. Um, but what, the, what the, the, the slogan says in Portuguese is what is determining for unity is ideology and not geography. Right, social across the borders, ideology is what we need about. Um, and what does ideology mean? So it turns out that you know, the idea of state sponsored agriculture, uh, sorry, state sponsored industry, um, you know, financed by Soviet aid, that was a failure, that was plan A. The idea of self reliance, sort of bootstrapping your way up through agriculture, that failed, that was plan B. Plan C is farm direct investment. The capitalists will fund your development. Okay. But then how are you not building capitalists, right? How are you building socialism, the capitalists on your development? Well, the answer is, if the communists are in charge of the politics, right, then you keep the capitalists at arm's length. Um, and so you can allow, right, you can control the political impact of, you know, private capital as long as you control politics, right? You can prevent the capitalists from taking over your political system. And so that's the new, the new advice, right, is that, is that instead of, you know, building sort of bottom up, right? You change the economy, you change the political structure, now it's the other way around, right? You shifted the, the, the equation. So now if you control the politics, right, you can control the economy. And so where this ends up is that the Soviets advise the Angolans, right, don't collectivize agriculture, right? Encourage you know, private investment and encourage foreign investment, including the oil sector, which is why you end up with a completely absurd situation in Angola, where you have an American oil company pumping oil that is being protected by Cuban troops because that oil is funding the MPLA regime, right? The, the, the socialist regime from American backed Bermuda guerrillas. Right? The United States is paying and arming guerrillas to attack Gulf oil, which is being protected by Cuban troops. Um, so that's where this model ends up, right? That private capital and foreign direct investment, when controlled by a socialist political system, right? A socialist party state is the way forward for socialist economy to develop. Um, so that's, that's the trajectory of the economic model. So look at the political models, how those evolve over time. Am I taking too much time? Okay. So again, democracy versus authoritarianism. So in Indonesia, right, 1950s, Indonesia has a parliamentary democracy. The communists have about one quarter of the seats in parliament. It looks like they're growing. The communists are the most powerful nation in the country. Maybe parliamentary democracy is the way forward. But Sukarno, the president of Indonesia, decides that parliamentary democracy is getting us nowhere. He wants a guided democracy, which basically means that he has the control the system. And the Soviets actually encouraged the PKI, the Communist Party of Indonesia, the world's largest non-voting communist party, to support Sukarno's overthrow of democracy. The idea being that, yes, parliamentary democracy is a, you know, is a block in the way towards socialism, 
right? The bourgeois parties will never let us get there. And so if we have a left-leaning radical president, right, he can lead us to socialism quicker than through the parliamentary path. And they support the overthrow of democracy in Indonesia. Um, they actually convince the PPI that supports the card. Um, this goes badly in Indonesia, um, ends with the massacre of half a million communists and suspected communists in 65 and 66. And so so we decide, well, guess what? Maybe democracy wasn't as bad as we thought. So this guy named Salvador Allende wins an election. Um, the first Marxist president elected um, uh, to be president in Chile. Um, and this is a pressure that a secret party claimed in March 1971. Say, well, maybe this is the way to go. Right? He says, right, in terms of the victory of the Adam Popularis, the government in Chile, right, we can't talk about this for obvious reasons at the party congress. We can't say this publicly. But here in our auditorium, it's possible that the coming to power of communist socialists, the constitutional path, right, if they manage to hold on to power and realize their program, will have immense principal significance and could seriously help the further along of many Latin American countries. So he's saying maybe this is the way forward, right? Maybe if we stick to the parliamentary path, maybe right, a coalition on the left that comes to power, right, this could be the way forward. This could be sort of the way around the resistance towards revolution in Latin America. So if it works in Chile, maybe it works in Argentina, maybe it works in Brazil, and maybe it works in Peru, and you know, maybe it works in France and Italy, which have powerful communist parties and parliamentary systems. So, right now they're saying, let's give democracy a chance. Um, and they actually push this within the coalition. So I have a whole chapter on Chile in the book, which has this in great detail. Um, but the point is, the coalition under Allende is very divided. It's actually the Socialist Party, in which Allende is a member, that's considered the more powerful. <laughs> The one that's you know closer to the Chinese and the Cubans, and the communists who are closer to Moscow and considered more conservative. Um, and part of this division in terms of you know where this government is going to go, what they're going to do in terms of you know conservatives and radicals on the left is whether or not to preserve constitutional democracy. Um, and with the Communist Party, right, acting at Soviet direction, that wants to preserve constitutional democracy, wants to have elections in 1976, but doesn't want to have radical constitutional changes. Their goal instead is to try to win over the middle class. Uh, represented by the Christian Democrats, to create a durable parliamentary majority with which they can govern for the foreseeable future. That is the goal, is like to create a durable majority that will allow them to build socialism through legal parliamentary means. While the socialists are saying, we should ally with the far left, we should have you know, massive constitutional reforms, and probably a civil war. Um, and so this is the extent which the are willing to promote democracy as the, as the, the path forward. It doesn't end well in Chile either. So this is the, the coup of uh, September 11, 1973, that overthrows Allende. Um, and so again, lesson learned, right? Democracy didn't work either. So what do we do now? So they talked about Chile in 1979 um, when the Shah's overthrow in Iran. Um, the Shah's overthrow, you have this weird situation where you have, you have Islamist revolutionaries, you also have you know, the Mujahideen, the Fedayon, who are different kinds of Marxists. Um, meanwhile, they put in place sort of a placeholder government, which includes people who are religious, but also technocrats and liberals and educated in the West. And so it's not really clear. The idea that the Shah's overthrow and there's going to be an Islamist Republic afterwards, right, that took a couple of years to consolidate. Nobody knew what government was going to replace the Shah when he left Iran in 1979. Um, so the Soviet strategy, right, instead of saying, okay, so let's have, let's go with the liberal democracy, the Soviet strategy is actually no. The problem is we can't trust the liberals. Because as we saw in Chile, right, the liberals will ally with the, the old regime and the military and the Americans, and there could be a CIA coup. So we can't trust democracy, we can't trust the liberals. Who do they trust instead? Khomeini. Right? The strategy in 1979, the Soviets tell the two dead, the Communist Party of Iran, to support Ayatollah Khomeini because he is the only one they know for sure is anti-American and anti-imperialist, and therefore he is the one that represents the popular revolution in Iran. And so the Soviets advised the two dead, right, to um, support the creation of an Islamic Republic instead of a parliamentary democracy, because that is more robust to the kind of threat the United States might represent to the Green regime, given the example of Chile. Um, it doesn't end well for the two dead. Um, by 1982-1983, um, first of all, the two dead helps Khomeini hunt down the Mujahideen and the Fedayeen guerrillas uh, in their hiding places, and then they come in 1983-1984 for the two of themselves who are the leaders are tortured, confessed on TV, uh, and mostly on the So it doesn't end well for the two deaf. Um, so that's, right, the, the political narrative. Oh, mobilizing, um, mobilizing narratives. So how does the narrative change? Think about talking about, um, you know, ethnic, racial, gender divides, 
narratives for oppression and liberation, and how you try to sell a class-based ideology to people who see oppression and liberation in different terms. So first of all, there's a, a shift in terms of the attitude towards religion. So Lenin made a famous distinction between oppressor nationalities and oppressed nationalities, right? There's nationalism, right, is you know supposed to be reactionary, but in practice, Lenin says, well, only the nationalism of the oppressor countries, the imperialist countries, British nationalism, French nationalism, Russian nationalism, um, are reactionary. The nationalism of oppressed nationalities, right, those that are fighting for independence, those can be progressive. So they make the same distinction between oppressor religions and oppressed religions. Um, so yes, all religions are the open of the masses in the long run, but in the short run, you have religions like Christianity that were used to oppress others, and you have religions like Islam and Buddhism, which are used to resist colonialism. Um, and so they begin to embrace this narrative. This is Sukarno, president of Indonesia. Um, and he's the one who sort of makes the argument that Islam is a religion of the oppressed, and therefore Islam can be progressive and a force for revolution. Um, and this is part of why the Soviets begin to you know, warm up to someone like Sukarno. Um, they begin to embrace the narrative of the peoples of the developing world. This, takes the, this is a Chinese problem, you know, the Soviets were not very happy about this. Um, but, you know, they begin to embrace the idea of a revolution of non-white peoples against white peoples. Right? This is another idea of, you know, how do you translate this, you know, class-based ideology into, into you know, narrative of oppression liberation. Um, this takes many forms. So, for example, um, Sukarno embraces this in Indonesia. They try to hold the Olympics of the newly emerging forces, right? This is over the IFC. This is a smaller version. Um, Sukarno and the Chinese also want to create a new version of the United Nations, right? All as ways of embracing the idea of power of the global south, power of the colored people of the world against sort of the imperialist white door. Um, and this translates, right? Reach this logical conclusion as well. If you think about the way the opening of Radio Tehran, this is again, you know, after the revolution, they portray themselves as the voice of the right, the voice of the oppressed, the voice of the uncalled for the wrong. Once again, this is a marriage of narratives of oppression and, um, you know, religion. Um, this is, I, I, I like this because uh, I don't know if we have time for, for Q&A, I think yes, but what I'll tell you is that if you read these quotes, um, one of them is by an atheist Soviet communist, and one of them is by an Iranian Ayatollah, and I'm trying to figure out which is which. <laughs> Um, so I'll just tell you that the one who talks about competing with each other on social systems and scientific progress, the conquest of space, that's Ayatollah Khomeini. And the one who criticizes, you know, vulgar, ideologically empty literature, autocratic gangsters, courts, courts, and praise of adultery, that is Amadish Dhan, that is Dhan's chief ideologist. Um, so in terms of the narratives, right, how they actually play out, that they're a lot closer than one might imagine. Um, so let's talk about where we end up, right? So I said this is about the evolution of socialism over the course of the Cold War. So where are we now by the end of the Cold War? So there's three chief transformations. One, uh, as I talked about, is the shift from a focus on Stalinist industrialization, right, the idea of large-scale state-controlled industry, that's how you build communism, to Leninist political organization. The way you build communism is you build a Leninist state party system, and then you, know, you have kind of like almost a next cycle economy. You have you know, small-scale markets, you have foreign investment, right? You can do that as long as you control the, the heights of the politics. So this is the inversion relationship between Politics economics. Right? The Marxist idea that the economics determines the politics has turned on its head, and now it's the politics that determines the economics. And this has been very faithful to a lot of the world. So to this day in Southern Africa, essentially every country south of the DRC, right, including Tanzania, is still run by a Leninist single party city, a Leninist single party system. They're still party states. They still have politburos and central committees and party congresses. And by the way, when they have party congresses, every other party in the region sends a delegation along with the Cubans and the North Koreans. Um, I've actually been to one of these party congresses in Angola. Um, right, this is, so, so and, and you know, the MPLA in Angola essentially abjured the Marxist Leninism in 1992. They said only like socialism, but they have not lost an election since, right? The MPLA has never lost an election. The CCM in Tanzania has never lost an election. Freely the Wombo the never lost an election. Swapo in Namibia, the ANC in South Africa, right? These are single party states in part because, right, it's the political structure that prevents the opposition from coming to power. Um, these are not, they hold elections, right? But if you have a party state, the opposition is never really actually capable of winning, let alone governing. Um, and so the legacy of this, you know, shift from Stalinist industrialization to Leninist political systems has, you know, remained in place in Southern Africa long after they've given up on socialism. Um, and right, this was this was an intentional choice. So as the Mozambicans are trying to figure out right, a political system in 1976, right, this is what they're saying. Right, the problem is we're in an intermediate phase of transition of socialism. 
right? What that means is we have not yet profoundly affected capital spaces of ownership. And therefore, certain possibilities for the spontaneous development of capitalist tendencies in the economy could enable the dispersal and strengthening of bourgeois ideals and social consciousness. And what they're saying is that we're in a transitional period towards socialism, in which capitalism is not dead and capitalism can disappear. But the problem is, right, capitalism and the economy could lead to capitalist tendencies in politics, bourgeois ideals and social consciousness. And we have to somehow allow capitalism in the economy without allowing it to consolidate its place in social consciousness, in culture, and in politics. So it's precisely because of this that for me, what the moving part of today, we have so much attention to the principles and conceptions of political and ideological leadership. How do you prevent capitalism in the economy from becoming capitalism in politics and culture? By making sure that you control the politics and the ideology. Um, and so this leads right to a closed political case that now has to run both the politics and the economy. So in Angola, by your son Angola State Oil Company, which is basically just an arm of the ruling party. And how are you, how can you be absolutely sure the people running the oil company are going to be ideologically loyal? Well, the same people running the country, right? You have good socialists running the country and they're running the oil company, which is great, except you've now created a ruling case that has dominance of both the politics and the economy. Um, and the NPLA is still justified this, right? This is still the case in Angola. They say, well, you know, what we actually need, we need ruling elites. And Angolans, rich, strong, and powerful families, as they wish competition, to have a republic of better fed poor people all in the third grade is not a viable model for us. Right? You don't get to socialism <laughs> by you know, educating the peasants and feeding them a little better. You get to socialism by having a ruling elite that controls the political system and the economy, um, and that can also develop the country. Right? That's, this is the justification of that. And again, the MPLA has never given up power to Angola. Um, so, the incorporation of markets as tools of socialism. Um, this is another important transformation. Right, central planning, because when people say, like, you know, you talk to people, especially people on the right, especially people at Harvard Business School, who think that, you know, socialism is gone, capitalism is defeated, right? It's central planning of the Stalinist model that's defeated, right? It's not all versions of socialism. Socialism, as you saw, has adapted to this. Um, so, right, over the course of, this, of, of, of the Cold War, right, socialists begin to adopt the idea that you actually need to have a role for markets inside socialist economies. And it's also applicable to the Cold War. So, when Jiao Bao, the reformist Chinese prime minister, um, who's much more open to market reforms than Xi Jinping is today, um, he talks about, in an interview, he said, right, the thing about Adam Smith is, you know, we love Adam Smith. Adam Smith is great, wealth of nations. But you have to be wealth of nations with theory of moral sentiments. Right? It's only when you understand right, that, you know, if you have the moral sentiment that allows the wealth to be distributed properly, right, that capitalism does its job. So it's, it's markets, but markets for social purposes. Um, I told how many something very simple, right? Talks about capitalism, right? If some people have capital and they use it to help the economy develop, then of course they also make some profit, right? We're not saying we're against profit. But then that active lesson is good and the profit makes a lot, right? There's good capitalism, <coughs> and there's bad capitalism. So you embrace markets, but you embrace markets for social purposes. Um, and this is very evident in the West Coast. Michael Harrington, founder of the DSA, um, he wrote this in 1989. This is the last book he wrote before his, before his death. The aim then is a socialism that makes markets the tool of non market purposes. And it's not totally utopian for the new socialists to argue that in liberating markets from the capitalist context that frustrates their virtues, the visible hand can use the invisible hand for its own purposes. Right? So the idea that socialism does have a role for markets, but the markets have to answer to social imperatives, right? this is now a dominant paradigm of what socialism means in the post-Cold War era, which is different what it meant right, in the kind of you know, Soviet context that we're used to. Um, and then finally, the adoption of other sources of legitimacy focused on anti-Western narratives. Right? So the idea of what narrative you coalesce around turns into anti-Western narratives, which has the paradoxical quality of, in many cases, um, supporting you know, anti-Western culture and you know, local reactionaries and certain things. So this is uh, an article from Tanzania 1968, a campaign by the Tanzanian Tanzanian Youth League. There's nothing modern about miniscripts. Right? How is this part of socialism? Because this is what it means to be anti-colonial, right? and therefore anti-Western. Um, and again, this is not this is not an Islamic country. This is not the Islamic Republic of Iran. Um, but this becomes far more universal, right, on the of embracing you know anti-Western cultural position um, than it was initially. Right, this is not what the Soviet Union would have thought of as socialism, you know, ten or twenty or thirty years before that. So, thank you very much. I look forward to your questions.
very interesting. Uh, and this one word, uh, what is scary depression? So, how does it fit in the picture? You just mentioned Indonesia. Uh, somebody uh, raised in a second world country, a Palestinian, I um, uh, turned to believe that uh, it is impossible to build socialist models without uh, killing millions of people. Is this really in the third world? Is it possible to build social not killing millions of people? Yeah. That's the question. So, I mean, it's hard to say yes because it's hard what to do that won't have to point to a successful example of building social. But it's really the case that people try. So, um, in the Tanzania chapter, especially, I go into this in great detail. You know, this example, one case in the Tanzania chapter where there's a report from, a, you know, they're trying to, to create a socialist village. And, you know, the problem is there's one person there who has two cows on the plot, but he doesn't want to give it to the collective. Um, so the question is what to do about this. And of course, in 1930, in the Soviet Union, there would have been a question. Right? You take the cows, you take the plow, you pull all kinds of peasants, send them to Siberia, and maybe you kill them. Right? But that's the whole point is that's not what you're doing. Right? Nereri insists that village nation has to be voluntary. Uh, and it has to be absent the violence that existed in the USSR to a certain degree, you know, China, Vietnam, and other places. Um, and so they end up doing forced civilization, which is violent in Tanzania, although not nearly as violent as it was like, on the scale of the USSR. But the point is that they do try. Um, so again, I can't say yes because I can't put a successful example, but the idea that this was a, a problem they identified and some people were trying to fix, um, I think was there, yes. Do you think that uh, such shift from focus on economics to the focus on the political organization might have backfired in the Soviet Union and basically led to showed the Soviet leadership that you can carry out liberalization reforms in economy and politics but still stay in power. And that's that's how they perceive the perestroika figures. So there's definitely a case that you know a lot of you know there, there's a relationship between the reformist economic thinking in the USSR and the reformist economic thinking in the developing world. So especially in the late 1970s and part of what I was saying in the beginning is that the problem is it's, it was easier to sort of experiment in the developing world because you didn't have the interests that you have in the USSR. Um, so that, you know, a lot of these do sort of come back to kind of haunt the Soviets, um, but at the same time, we're look at the model of China. The model of China looks successful. Um, and we make a mistake if you look at China and say that, you know, China decided to adopt capitalism or something like that, right? China in the 1980s, you know, if you read Julian Lord's book on like the Parthas, right, is very much interested in, you know, Janusz Kornai and Otto Schick and all sorts of economists, you know, the Lulash communist model, the Titoist communist model. Um, and so, you know, you look at that, and I think especially in the context of 2023, as opposed to what people were saying about China 10 years ago or 20 years ago, right? It, it's a lot clearer this was always an attempt to adapt socialism to market conditions. Um, so I think there's a separate question, which is, so if that's the case, right, why did this attempt to adapt the economics without the politics work in China, and not so much the USSR? So first of all, of course, Borchum does attempt to train the, you know, the politics as well in a way that Dung never really does. Um, but I get to this in my, in my first book, and I think it has a lot to do sort of with the nature of legitimacy of the regime, right? The Chinese regime was always legitimized on the basis of its ability to assert China's place in the world against the outside world. And, you know, so the CCP can say that, you know, even under a market economy, we've succeeded in doing that, right? We've, we've raised China's GDP, we've raised China's stature in the world. Um, the Soviet Communist Party wasn't really, I mean, Russia was an imperialist power before that, right? It wasn't justifying itself on the basis of you know, its ability to assert Russia's place in the world, which is interesting because it's like Putin is doing that to a certain degree right now. But it was, it had no other justification besides, you know, economic egalitarianism. And so that justification disappears. It really had no, no reason for being power anymore. So I think, right, this is something that it affected both. It succeeded in China. Um, I think there are reasons why, right, China was able to succeed in Russia. But that does not exhaust the reasons why. Thank you. Thank you for the uh, threads and the broad scope of the coverage. It's really helpful. Uh, my question is about socialism. I think uh, you focus on ideology and then state leaders' adoption of socialism for development and also diplomatic condition for the state leaders, third world leaders, to use them. So I totally uh, agree with you. But what about the revolution? Because I was a little confused by the title, Right for Revolution. Going back to the first question. So can you call the military coup revolutionary? So what's the distinction between the two? When revolution was made by the state leaders for a coup or a political power, can you call it revolution? So can we, do we need to make a distinction between the two? So, so first, the title comes from, the reason I'm called Right for Revolution is because 
Joan Lai gave a speech in Mogadishu in February of 64 in which he, he actually did not use the words right for revolution, but he said that Africa is ready for revolution and the New York Times report is right for revolution, so everybody called it right for revolution. But that's that was where the slogan came from. The idea that you know China, in the form of Joan Lai, had said that Africa was right for revolution. Um, but you're exactly right that how what form of revolution would take was precisely one of the questions, right? Because the idea of the working class taking power, first of all, that you know, arguably never really happened in that form anyway. I mean, in China, you have a civil war. You have an army that takes power. Um, in, right, in Russia, you have you know, power is taken in the name of the Soviets by the Central Military Committee, and then you have a civil war after that. Um, you know, maybe Cuba sort of follows that model better. Um, but they were sort of open to the different ideas about what to constitute revolution. So is it a revolution if you win in the ballot box? Right? Does Chile have a revolution? Um, according to the Soviets, yes. I mean, there's plenty of books titled, you know, about the lessons of the Chilean revolution and such. Um, it's really, the Soviets really call it a revolution. China does not call what happened to Chile revolution, right? Because China's view at that point is that, you know, you have to actually fight um, to take over power. If you, if, if Billy was fighting, then there wasn't really a shift in power. Um, this also underlies, right, this was a view that was held by the Soviets about earlier. This is why, for example, under Stalin, they were very suspicious of, you know, post-colonial elites, um, especially people with Nero in India, for example. They thought, well, you know, there were revolutionaries in India. Nero was clearly close with there was no, there was no fighting, there was no you know, military transfer of power. And so what this basically was is the British handing over you know, control of India to someone they trust. Uh, but because there was no revolutionary violence, there couldn't have been an actual revolution. So the Soviets sort of changed their mind on that then uh, under Khrushchev. The Chinese don't change their mind on that really at this point you know, under Mao at all. Um, but, so, but if power comes from the barrel of the gun, right? it comes from fighting, well then it seems like maybe you, know, you could have revolution um, through military force, which doesn't involve necessarily you know, dominated by the workers and peasants. But for the most part, that is Mao's model of revolution. So I think there is one thing that is in question is what is a model of revolution? So is it workers taking power in industrial cities? Is it peasant armies taking control of the country? Is it, you know, can it happen through the rise of a socialist leader? Can it happen those like Sukarno? Um, can it happen through parliamentary democracy? Um, so what is what is revolution? It's one that they, they differ on, and it's not entirely decided. Um, given your answer to several questions already, you know, if the revolution is not well defined and it's basically taking the power by the coup, and if reforms later on, you know, basically making a mixed system, you know, socialism changes its name to preserve the power of the ruling class, then the question is. Is Marx's theory at all holds? Which theory? The, the Marx theory of revolution. Well, I mean, of, 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 of socialism being the future and, and communism after that. Okay, so that, I think so. I think those are different questions, right? Now, there's the question of what socialism is the future, the question of whether you know revolution is necessarily part of that transition of what revolution means. So think about the case in Chile, for example, right? So what's interesting is that you know. One assumes that you know re when a revolution happens, the socialists take power and they build socialism. What happens in Chile is you have Marxist president who wins the election. But he wins, he wins the election, but he doesn't win the majority in parliament. He can't legislate, right? The opposition is still there. They still control most of the press. They still control most of the military. And so, has a revolution happened? Right? Have Marxists taken power? And the thing is, right? Instead of building socialism, right? Saying, okay, now we're in power. We're going to put together a socialist economic policy. What they're saying is, no, we have to have a transitional policy, which will allow us to attract enough people from the middle classes that we can get the rest of the power, the political power that we didn't get through the election. Right? We'll get a majority in parliament. We can control the press and such. So now, economic policy is a tool of the regime to gain more political power, so that one day you can have enough power to build socialism. Right. So now there's like kind of a dialectic between power and, and the economy. So the idea is that ultimately socialism is still the goal. Um, but, you know, first of all, it gets increasingly far off. Um, and second of all, right, it becomes less and less clear what that socialism looks like. Um, and so if you ask the question which comes next, which is, you know, okay, so then how do you tell in the meantime who's really a socialist and who's not? Um, in practice, it's, you know, who takes your side in the Cold War? Who takes your side in foreign policy issues, right? When it comes up to a vote in the UN or whether or not to condemn, let's say, the Prague Spring, right? Who votes to condemn and who votes not to? Right? That tells you who the socialists are, at least, for example, you know, in Africa. So being cynical, you know, you should just say, okay, you know, um, those, you know, those, you know, leaders who chose, you know, the, the socialist way, 
They wanted, you know, to go with the help from Soviet Union as opposed to the other leaders who wanted to, to go with the help from the United States. That's a very simple kind of scenario, you know. Although, you know, sentiments may be also below that, you know, but uh, the ultimate representation of that is the, the alliance, you know, where they align with whom to who. I think, I think that's true at a certain point for sort of, you know, how you just try to figure out who is who. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of effort put into this before you get to that point. So, I mean, the amount of ink spilled, you know, in, among Soviet experts to try to figure out who Nasser is, is Nasser really a revolutionary, is Nasser really a socialist, is he on our side, right? And you try to figure out what are his, what are his origins, right? Is he bourgeois? Is he petty bourgeois? Right? Is he from the working class, right? They spent a lot of time trying to figure this out. Um, and so, you know, there is a lot of attention paid to this. And then ultimately, right, as he begins to disappoint them, they figure out, right, is he still worth, you know, what happens in Iran, for example, for example, is as he begins to disappoint them, it turns out, it turns out that the Islamists are actually not going to support socialism. But at least they're still anti american so they're still useful to us internationally. Right? We don't need to oppose them. Uh, so that's kind of like a second stage after you become disillusioned with you know, the original socialist intent of the leadership. Yeah. How would you respond to the conclusion of someone who wrote about the demise of Soviet uh, communism, that the only place where socialism, communism could take uh, place, rules, is national liberation movement. Because there is a reason that you picked up the third world. What about the second world? And what, what about places like Yugoslavia, for instance? How did you think it all? I mean, they fit them all in terms of experimentation, right? So, there's certainly a lot of experimentation, and you know there is. I mean, I didn't get into this in this presentation. But there, are, there are Yugoslav economists in Chile, right, who are very heavily involved. There, I mean, Yugoslav, Yugoslavia is actually supporting the MPLA in Angola before you know the Soviets and Cubans get involved. So there's a lot more to this, right? Than, I mean, than the Fourth Amendment presentation. Um, but the kinds of experimentation that are going on in Yugoslavia and Hungary and Poland and elsewhere are also things that they're, that they're looking at. There's a whole article, article I have here. Um, from the Tanzanian newspaper, and what we can learn from Hungarian agriculture, um, which sounds a little silly in the title, but it's actually a really interesting article. Um, so, I mean, to a certain degree, especially in Yugoslavia, right, because of their kind of independence of the Soviet bloc, they can be somewhat more experimental. Um, again, I'm not saying that anybody actually succeeded in building a viable model of socialism, um, but the degree of experimentation was appreciated. Right? This is part of kind of a horizontal conversation. Uh, I'd like to ask about one of your central questions in the beginning and about the amount of ink spilled. You asked how should racial, ethnic, and national associations play into the development of socialism? And at the end, you mentioned how you can take the Leninist route and start to divide things into like liberating nationalism versus oppressive nationalism, apply that same sort of model to religion and have liberating religion versus oppressive religion. And in Yugoslavia, there's a lot of ink spilled to try and put the national liberation struggle into Marxist terms. Like Tito literally uses the word reification to say that they're reifying the nationalist struggle into like a real material class-based struggle. Do a lot of these countries even like think in those terms? Like, are they also trying to, in some place like Angola or Tanzania, take a national liberation struggle and view it through some sort of class lens, or is it just that this is a national liberation struggle and we're going to build socialism afterwards because we don't even have the material conditions to like have a revolution? No, they, they, they spent a lot of attention on this. Um, and so I, again, this, this is kind of a big overview presentation. There's a lot of detail in the book. Um, I highly recommend the Angola chapter for this. The, I mean, the story of the MPLA is fascinating because the MPLA has this problem. So has a problem here, which is that basically, you know, the main leadership of the MPLA is the initial constituency are not you know black African and Angolans, but people of mixed parentage who were sort of you know part of the elite of the capital of Rwanda, who were the ones who had the most access to education. So these are the ones who have the best chance to say go to Elizabeth or to Paris and get an education and be influenced by the French Communist Party, the Portuguese Communist Party. Um, and so a lot of the leaders, you know, Mario Andrade, um, you know, Lucio Lara, are people of mixed parentage, even of white parentage. So now you have a problem, which is that like the Liberation Party of Angola is led by people who aren't even black Africans. Um, and so, you know, one thing, for example, is that it's always an issue with people who are not, you know, who are not black Africans have too much power in the organization. Um, and so, but it also wants to list too much of an African nationalist. So the, the Soviets are especially frustrated by their There are a lot of leadership struggles. Again, you know, don't want to get into it here, but it's all in the book. And they, 
are frustrated with Nito, but they keep supporting Nito because Nito gives them the perfect compromise. He is a 100% black African who is married to a white European and who wants a post racial end goal. So he doesn't want to kick the Soviets out for being white imperialists, as opposed to others in the leadership of the But this becomes a perpetual threat to the enterprise legitimacy because there's always somebody who will claim. Right, that these are a bunch of you know forty Portuguese mestizo. Right, these are these are mestizo leaders allied with the white imperialist power, and so this is like Jonas and Mimi, the leader of Unida, right? Part of his sort of you know struggle in the nineteen eighties against the uncle leadership is that he's the real African nationalist against the national right. Um, but this becomes this becomes a major problem, including after independence. There's a guy named Nito Alves who launches the coup attempt in nineteen seventy seven, which is brutally suppressed by the NPL. Um, thousands of people are killed, um, and in part this is because you know, what happens is he's kind of the leader of like groups of MPLA youth in the slums of, of Rwanda who see, you know, people of mixed parentage and white parentage in a, in a position of political and economic privilege after the revolution. And they say, wait a minute, this is supposed to be our revolution. And so he sort of leads this uprising and that has to be crushed, right? So um, this is a perpetual threat and it's, I mean, it's still a sensitive issue. This is why, this is why Lucio Lago was, despite the fact that he was probably the most prominent political leader could not take over after Nito's death. Jose Eduardo de Santos was a non entity politically, but he was of the right ethnicity. Um, and by the way, I have in the book, I have conversations between Raul Castro and the Soviet ambassador about what happens if Nito dies. He's very sick. The two people behind him are both of mixed parentage. We need the black person in power. Like, what do we do? Who do we pick? Um, they're having these conversations in the late 1970s in Luanda. Uh, they're very important. How would you describe the impact on Western Marxism of these revolutions? So I think different revolutions um, impacted differently. Um, I would say in terms of the impact on Western Marxism, um, Tanzania and Chile are by far the most important. Um, so there's a tremendous amount of sympathy for, for Chile uh, and for what Chile was doing. Um, there's also the University of Dar es Salaam in the 1960s um, is a hotbed really of Western Marxism. Um, there's, so on the one hand, there, there's different relationships, right? The, the Soviets always want to keep Western Marxists at arm's length. They never really trust them to be true Marxist Leninists. They actually think, in many cases, that Western Marxists are leading the Africans astray. So, for example, the Jews Canary is a big fan of René Dumont. Um, the Soviets think this is a bad thing. Um, the, the, the leaders in question are someone like Nereri or someone like um, you know, Salvador Allende are much more receptive in certain cases. Um, Nereri is much more receptive than Allende, and Allende is thinking more towards the Cuban and Chinese side. Um, but Western Marxists are looking at them and trying to figure out, you know, what they think, you know, could be imported back into, into the West. So a lot of the discourse that I put on Michael Harrington at the end, um, in my conclusion, I go to greater depth on this. There are a lot of Western socialist analysts of what is happening in places like Mozambique in the 1980s, who say that, you know, this, along with the reforms in China and doing what reforms in, in Vietnam, saying that these are models for how socialism Elsewhere. These are models of how to integrate, you know, markets and, and, and non-market structures. So, in that sense, it's important, and it's certainly very important in terms of, you know, um, the integration of ethnicity, race, and gender into liberation struggles. Um, so, I think those are the, the most influential versions of this. What is the role of corruption then in undermining some of these socialist programs? Could you talk about? This idea we could transform and open up markets as long as we just kept this elite ruling class in the social system. But if they're not sort of this benevolent rulers that are actually accumulating wealth themselves, how is that undermined? So, one interesting point, this is probably not going to totally answer your question, but one interesting point about this is that that's actually um, an ever present theme in the in Islamist discourse in Iran. Um, so, uh, Ayatollah Talabani, um, it's called the, the Red Ayatollah. He was the, the Imam Jumea of the main mosque in, in, in Tehran in the 1940s. And this is a time in which the two guys were very powerful. And so it's sort of like he was essentially competing with Marxism for kind of like the ideological loyalty of the sort of upper middle class in Tehran. And he wrote a book on the Islamic economy. Uh, and the first president of Islamic Iran is a guy named Ayatollah, um, um, sorry, is a guy named Abu Hassan Bani Sadr, who was educated in the Sorbonne, who was described as a, a, a Islamist Franco Maoist. Um, by the two which is you know confusing, but he was but he was an economist from the Sorbonne who was a supporter of Khomeini as first president, and and the way this works together is that they basically argued that you know Islamism can do what socialism couldn't precisely because Islamism has religion, and therefore you know it can run a just economy because the people who run the economy are moral, right? That the the, the, the fundamental flaw in socialism is that somebody has to plan the economy and those people are immoral because they're atheists. 
So if you have more people at the center, right, you can avoid the problem of corruption. So like, so they, so the sense that Islamists were using that as kind of like the Achilles heel of socialism, and that's what they were selling is, you know, did this sort of work in Iran, um, but there's at least an awareness of the problem. Um, in terms of like how, like, was this something that socialists sort of sought to solve on a, on a global basis? Um, I think not with any effectiveness, right? There's no, <laughs> no successful answer there. Thank you so much for such a fascinating talk. You are so knowledgeable about what I am just on John Rob. Uh, you know, I would like to go back to the question of the young gentleman about the impact of the Western socialists and communists. Um, because I think uh, one third of my life in Middle East, one third in Europe, one third in the US, and this is like, like my life story I am seeing. Uh, and I see the impact, what is the impact of the communists and socialists in the academic world of the US? Because when I look at the things, I realize that um, in my point of view, um, communists kind of brainwash the academic world uh, and academic um, world of US and everywhere in Europe, because people are um, like looking at uh, supporting people like uh, Islamic Republic and so on and all the Western things and condemning the things. Have you looked at that? That is the impact because for the world it's looked like that US is the worst country on the world, has the most racist and everyone like people in Europe, my friend thinks that everyone is killing all the black people and black people are a slave and, uh, and we see the consequences even right now that Iranian president and Iranian foreign minister can talk about Israel and condemn all these things and warn the US why nobody say you should be quiet because your own people are dying and your own people dreaming about being bombed to just get rid of you. Uh, and all the I'm watching Deutsche Welle, I'm watching France TV, I'm watching Japanese, BBC, all of them. They are all supporting Hamas. Why it looks like that someone come and like rip off the whole population of California because thousand people in Israel is equal to whole California and people still say that all oh, Israel should be. This is the communist ideas that is in academia. Have you looked at that? during the time, from the time of like 70s to now? So just, it's a lot to respond to. Just a lot of, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, have, I have a lot of thoughts about that. I would recommend that you read, um, I don't know if you read Michel Foucault's book on the Iranian Revolution. He was actually in Iran soon after the revolution. Um, and his perspective on what he saw in Iran and what he thought about is, is, is very interesting. Um, it's really like one of the most direct instances of kind of like a Western Foucault was not necessarily Marxist Leninist, really not by that point in his life, but um, at least someone who's an important figure on the Western left. And his encounter with the revolution that, you know, really at that point no one understood, but it didn't fit into anybody's schema of the idea of the Islamic revolution. Uh, so I think, I think that's worth looking at. In terms of, you know, the influence on the West more generally, I mean, I think, you know, that one thing, right, you do see here, and right, I talked about this before, is that there is, you know, you kind of need a simplified schema. This is sort of how ideology works, right? You need a simplified schema to understand how the world operates. Um, and so, you know, a lot of, I mean, a lot of the discourse you see today, right, you can find echoes of it, for example, in terms of, you know, on the Western left in, in, in you know, in Vietnam. So, you know, there were a lot of, I actually wrote an article about this um, in, in, in foreign policy a few months ago, that, you know, there are many reasons, for example, for, you know, that inspired the anti-war movement in the uh, United States and Vietnam. Um, and, you know, there were a lot of things, you know, that we questioned about whether what it should have been in Vietnam, what it was doing in Vietnam, right, it had a right to be in Vietnam, the tactics it was using in Vietnam, all sorts of good questions. But then there were also people in the leadership of the anti war movement, Tom Hayden, who came to the conclusion that the United States, the cause of the left and the student movement in the United States was the same as the cause of the Viet Cong, right? And this, you know, that North Vietnamese victory was a positive good for the American left. This would help liberate, you know, people in the United States at the same time. Um, and that, you know, I think, first of all, I think it was a bridge too far. I think he misunderstood the nature of what was happening in Vietnam. He misunderstood the North Vietnamese. Um, but, 
uh, you know, it, he also misunderstood the relationship between what was happening in Vietnam and what was happening in the United States. And, um, and so I think, you know, you, you, you can, you know, come to this sort of, right, binary Manichaean position because you're trying to make difficult ideological distinctions. Um, but, and you end up sort of oversimplifying the point that, you know, what the only criteria you know for sure decides who's a revolutionary, for example, is who is anti-American. That's one of the points you was making about Khomeini. And I think, you know, when things get too complicated, you end up with a sort of oversimplification, you end up sort of misidentifying, right? Who's really on what side and who's sort of a liberator and who's an oppressor. But that's a very complicated question to get into for a lot longer. Thank you so, so much.